Hello and welcome to this special edition of BizTalk, Develop the Real Economy, Create New Engine for Economic Growth. I'm Michelle Vandenberg in Beijing. The 20th National Congress of the Communist Party mapped out a blueprint for China's future economic development. During the National Congress, real economy is underlined as the mainstay for growth and prosperity. So how can China's real economy be developed further? What policy measures will be in place to boost growth? And what are the new engines of economic growth? Now, to dig deeper into these questions, I'm joined by Mr. Liu Baocheng, Dean of Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economics, uh, Mr. Li Yong, Chief Researcher and at DNC Think Tank. We also have Dan Wang, Chief Economist of Hang Seng Bank, China, and also Daniel Zhang, Broad Group Vice CEO. Welcome to the show, everyone. So now let's start with the big picture. So we're approaching year end, and the third quarter economic data just came out last year, uh, last week, uh, rather. So how is China's <coughs> economy uh, so far this year, and <coughs> what has been the major driver behind growth? Why don't we start with uh, Wang Dan, lady first. Uh, well, so far, the economic recovery is in acceleration. We have seen major improvements in the third quarter data comparing to the second quarter, and the quarantine is relaxed greatly. Uh, for the rest of the year, we anticipate export and infrastructure spending remaining to be the main pillar for growth. Uh, this year, if we have to give a rough estimate, about 40% of the growth will be coming from export, another 40% coming from investment, uh, and the consumption will contribute to the remaining uh, 15 to 20%. Mm -hmm. And what's your take, Daniel, on that? My take would be um, encouragements on continuous uh, climate action, decarbonization, sustainable development, and I think those are core drivers for future economic growth. All right. What about you, uh, Professor Liu? This year, so far, uh, in the past 10 months, what were the main growth drivers? Well, I, I pretty much agree with Dan that uh, infrastructure, uh, the uh, high-level manufacturing, and also Chinese export. Mm -hmm. So these really continue to serve as the engine for China's growth. But right now, as uh, uh, Daniel has mentioned, you know, sustainable development becomes also a, uh, I should say, uh, a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, in the short term, it may slash the economy uh, in terms of the uh, growth rate, but uh, over a long term, it contributes to a high level of uh, growth mm -hmm. and uh, contributes more of the added value for Chinese output, either for the domestic market and also for the destination abroad. Mm -hmm. What's your take? Um, I think, you know, probably, the, uh, yes, I agree with the previous speakers and uh, the, uh, uh, the drivers uh, of the economic growth uh, up to now, I think, basically is from manufacturing, mm -hmm. which registered a uh, uh, kind of growth uh, beyond expectation. The other one is infrastructure, as mentioned by other speakers. Uh, uh, you know, I infrastructure is going to contribute, uh, uh, you know, uh, the economic growth in the future as well. It is an important part of the uh, economic growth. And uh, uh, the third one is export. Uh, even though the uh, the rate of export uh, is, uh, uh, you know, by uh, of, of the third quarter is uh, is not really as high, uh, but still it is a kind of a uh, achievement uh, made uh, during the uh, you know, the challenging international environment. And I think that will continue to contribute uh, to the future economic growth. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, you, if you notice that uh, the infrastructure development is also shifting the focus. We used to deal with roads, ports, and those uh, uh, very uh, large projects. But now uh, we are shifting on two directions. One is the uh, what we, uh, what we call new infrastructure development, which mm -hmm. is focused more on uh, data transflow and uh, the, uh, uh, the connectivity uh, that is uh, on the soft part. Uh, the mm -hmm. other is that, uh, f uh, particularly for this year, infrastructure development is much more catered to urban uh, 
and uh, rural connectivity uh, and, uh, uh, and also very much resonate with the Chinese uh, rural rejuvenation program by providing you know, uh, gas pipelines to the uh, individual villages and by improving <coughs> the irrigation system for the Chinese arable land and also by providing support for the forestation. So uh, this is really uh, something that's uh, uh, a welcome gesture because uh, so far the hard part of uh, you know the roads and railroads and ports uh, etc are almost there. Mm -hmm. So we need to shift the gear uh, and continue on the infrastructure to elevate uh, the Chinese high quality growth. Yes, uh, I think infrastructure needs to be understood in a broader concept. Okay. Um, for example, uh, the uh, uh, the industrial mm -hmm. industrialization infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, like the rural uh, development infrastructure, urban uh, infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, digital infrastructure, uh, you know, green development infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and all those infrastructure uh, a development efforts is going to uh, uh, is going to be uh, the key mm -hmm. drivers. Uh, of the future economic growth, of course, it has remained uh, drivers of the uh, of the economic growth, uh, you know, this year and uh, uh, and the years, uh, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago. I think this, since the effort has become the the key focus of the economic development. What about Dan and Daniel? Anything that you guys want to add on that? Well, uh, for infrastructure spending, we're pretty much reaching its upper limit um, because when we look at the local government finances, they are getting into deep water. And now in this turning point, we probably is looking at a period of development when the local government is quite cost conscious and infrastructure will be the main driver this year and possibly next year. But I can't see it being a sustainable driver for the decade to come. Right, so it's just for the short term. What about Daniel? <laughs> infrastructure, especially green development infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And globally, uh, we are a leader in renewable resource, renewable energy investment. Uh, China's uh, a lead, definite leader in wind power, solar power, and all sorts of uh, decarbonization technologies. And I think ultimately we'll see in, uh, in decades to come that uh, China will become a main exporter of uh, renewable technology to the world. And uh, personally, in our, in our business at Broad Group, uh, we, all of our technologies are benefiting from um, uh, this kind of a uh, higher uh, sustainable consciousness and the consumer behaviors and uh, uh, big business uh, uh, purchase are shifting towards uh, more greener options. Mm -hmm. Now let's move on to the 20th National Congress of CPC, which was concluded already. What were the major takeaway uh, for you guys from the meeting? Uh, what were the highlights for you? Let's start with Dan again. Well, the 20th Parties Congress has basically laid out the development path for the next decade. And we have seen great emphasis on national security and deep technology. And that's quite different from the model that we've been following in the last decade when we focus on consumer market and investment. So that means in the coming years, we'll see way more state-backed R&D investment into the advanced manufacturing and other type of technology like astronautics and aeronautics, uh, deep sea technology, biotech, and et cetera. So that means China is officially in transition from its past uh, consumer-led, investment-led model to this innovation-based economic model. Mm -hmm. What about you, Daniel? What's your takeaway? I think um, advanced manufacturing is going to become an emphasis and uh, uh, seeing um, more digitalization in the industrial sector where we are uh, moving towards uh, more advanced, um, uh, more data-driven manufacturing instead of the, the previous uh, kind of um, handmade mm -hmm. uh, mass volume. But now it's uh, really about automation, robotics, as well as uh, attention to resource efficiency. Yeah. What about you guys? Well, I think the uh, two major focuses is uh, 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 one is the 
uh, enhancement of uh, Chinese uh, modernization because we used to have uh, the full modernization raised in uh, 1954. Uh, that was really the continuous uh, journey for uh, the uh, Chinese-led type of uh, uh, growth. And uh, right now, uh, we are shifting more from the hard modernization to more of the soft organization because mm -hmm. we used to rely on the modernization of agriculture, industry, science and technology, and also national defense. Mm -hmm. But right now, uh, the emphasis is placed on good governance. And good governance uh, relies on how uh, we can really successfully uh, you know, manage the complexities and uh, uncertainties. Right now we are all facing both internally and externally. And uh, uh, the uh, modernization is also there to be more holistic mm -hmm. uh, because we, uh, the report also mentioned about how we can really build a harmonious uh, society among our people, and how do we address the uh, contradiction uh, between the uh, economic growth versus uh, the environmental protection, and how to address the uh, international relations uh, while China maintains to be a peacekeeper, but also to uh, the encounter uh, mm -hmm. the uh, headwinds uh, of uh, global hegemony and the unilateralism and, and also, also protectionism. protectionism. So, so uh, this, this is, is a more, more demanding, demanding time for Chinese modernization uh, so far. And there are many different voices, mm -hmm. both at home and abroad, uh, you know, for or against some of the big uh, steps ahead. And the other is the shared prosperity, uh, because uh, we do see that uh, the socialism uh, by its own very essence is really to uh, provide the uh, entitlement to everyone that is really there to contribute. Mm -hmm. So how we can really streamline the, uh, uh, the wealth polarization, uh, it's not really there to deprive the rich and compensate the poor, but so that you know, everyone can really be uh, entitled to equal opportunity at the starting point and uh, also that uh, how companies can really uh, compete on the same level playing fields, and then you know, how, the, uh, how the government can provide uh, a better service to mm -hmm. the public so that er everyone can have a fair share, like you know, the medication program, like the uh, public ed education. And as an ed educator for my life, I uh, do expect that uh, we can really specifically you know, they uh, provide 12 years of free education, and this is really feasible and possible mm -hmm. for our future growth because uh, the report also says that uh, we need to step up on the, uh, you know, boosting of the Chinese talent pool, mm -hmm. uh, supporting education, and also uh, the scientific discovery, but uh, without the right type of talent pool overspread and the ecosystem for continued uh, innovation will be very much more challenged. Yeah, so shared prosperity, coordinated development in different regions in right. China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What were your key takeaways? Uh, I think in addition to the uh, uh, observations made mm -hmm. by the previous speakers, I think uh, probably we should uh, also uh, recognize the uh, focus uh, on transformation of the uh, of, of the economy as a whole. In addition to the observations by the other uh, speakers, I would like to uh, add uh, or emphasize uh, that uh, uh, the transformation effort being uh, expressed in the report, mm -hmm. uh, that is the modernization. And uh, most important of all, I think uh, there is a, uh, uh, an expression of a continuity of China's open door policy, which is very important, uh, no. particularly when they are when they are we are facing the headwinds uh, of the global economy, particularly the deglobalization uh, uh, trend. Uh, I think you know those uh, are very important in terms of uh, of the country uh, on its path to modernization, mm -hmm. industrialization, rural. Uh, revitalization, mm -hmm. etc. 
So in the CPC report, China also emphasized on developing the real economy. Um, Dan, you mentioned about a lot more investment into the R&D. Um, so what else do you think needs to be done to boost China's real economy? Uh, the real economy largely rests on two things. One is people and the other is finance. And now there is a big plan to reform China's education system with a focus on cultivating more high-end talents mm -hmm. in artificial intelligence and smart manufacturing. But when it comes to finances, I think it's a bigger problem. Uh, our financial systems still largely depend on banking, and we know that banks tend to take as little risks as possible, which is incompatible with our emerging industries, which are largely focusing on new material, new energy that are highly risky. So we need to uh, actually prioritize the development of the capital market, and that would be the foundation for acceleration of the real economy. Mm -hmm. And Daniel, you mentioned about digitalization of the manufacturing uh, sector. How important is um, high-level manufacturing in boosting China's real economy? I believe we will see uh, greater efficiency and higher quality products and uh, reducing waste on um, invisible costs, which uh, maybe in, uh, in times of uh, yeah, in times of uh, more abundance, but mm -hmm. uh, real economy is really about benefiting um, the resources to the people. So, so I believe digitalization of manufacturing will uh, really bring about uh, a new paradigm in, um, in, in, the, in the future made in China products. Yeah. Also to achieve high quality growth, talent is a very important factor. How can we... Um, you know, cultivate innovative talents going forward. Uh, Daniel, why don't we start with you first? I believe our university is already um, doing a wonderful job and we are training more, I think, um, uh, engineers uh, than any country, any nation in the world. And really it's about the industry uh, is changing their standards. And uh, I think it will be a, a future collaborative model between the industry, between education and companies and, mm -hmm. and the markets. And that uh, eventually will become uh, maybe a more um, holistic um, um, talent uh, development program. Mm -hmm. uh, universities are part of it, but really the, the industries are also catching up to uh, offering uh, real combat um, experiences. Mm -hmm. Dan, you also mentioned about uh, talent. How can we cultivate um, innovative and like high quality talents to, 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 to um, help with the uh, high level industrialization? Uh, well, China is uh, in no shortage of high end talents, mm -hmm. but there has been a long time of mismatch between what the market wants and what the universities can provide. Uh, of course, we know that university research labs are quite important because they need to focus on the basic scientific research. Uh, the industries, though, can provide uh, the frontline insight in what's actually going on, especially in areas like artificial intelligence uh, and things like smart driving. So we would like to see more, actually, collaboration between the corporate sector and the universities to make it a more targeted approach when it comes to educating students. Also, Dan, you mentioned about the importance of finance to developing the real economy. Could you elaborate on that? How can financial sector help with boosting China's real economy? The financial sector has always been an enabler for the real economy. Uh, it doesn't really initiate any agenda, um, but when it comes to green transition, uh, financial industry is quite crucial. Uh, for my bank, for example, uh, similar to many other banks, we're trying to design new products, new financial derivatives to lower the cost of borrowing for emerging industries. It has been quite difficult because it requires a collaboration from other departments by specifying the right standards in calculating carbon emission, for example, to track the right amount of uh, uh, pollution in every step uh, during the production process. And the banks can help to lower the financing risks and also identify uh, the right kind of industry to support. 
But then um, the industries will also need to uh, make it more convenient for the financial industry to actually uh, do their risk model. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be quite aware that China's financing industry is very much dependent on banks. Um, and now the, with a the new development model and that will be heavily reliant on uh, the national security related industry, that means a lot more state-backed funding will crowd in the market. And that would create additional challenges actually for Chinese financial institutions. Okay, Daniel, you are in China's real economy, basically. So how do you think the financial industry can f further boost um, the real economy? What do you think needs to be done? I echo with uh, uh, Ms. Wandan's um, uh, description that finance is an enabler. And uh, what we pay attention to are how can finance um, uh, pinpoint what are uh, low emission technologies and what are uh, green um, industries and can provide more uh, favorable um, financial tools to support such businesses. Uh, in one of our business where we um, help our uh, facility, our clients' facilities to reduce their operating uh, energy consumption. And uh, these, uh, this kind of business model happens um, uh, more as a service. So. So we offer 30 year or 40 year very long term contracts for such as their airports or their their factories or power plants. And um, uh, the upfront investments are very high and financial institutions uh, comes in to offer um, uh, to, to offer uh, loans to invest into such um, low uh, consumption or high energy efficiency infrastructure. And this kind of business model would not exist if there isn't a financial mechanism. And, um, and, and I think uh, projects are at various scales, not just immense, large, uh, centralized, renewable uh, energy generation infrastructure or energy efficiency infrastructure, but also these uh, small decentralized, uh, closer to the consumer side type of um, uh, green projects uh, that would also get noticed by large fi financial um, uh, players uh, in the world. I think also in the financial um, um, uh, ecosystem, there are uh, there are various tiers of, uh, of uh, funds of uh, decision making, and uh, and already I think in the Bank of China, in uh, in, in some of the central banks uh, all around the world, there has been um, hard requirements on uh, corporate ESG and project ESG, and then uh, following that, more private banks are perhaps could be a, a lot more innovative in supporting projects uh, from energy to manufacturing, uh, even to uh, sustainable housing. Uh, I'm an architect, so that's what I, uh, I, uh, I pay attention to more. And I think that's also an extremely crucial part of the real economy is that how can we create higher energy uh, comfort, temperature comfort, uh, living comfort, while consuming uh, less resources. And that will be part of the social, uh, socialist uh, society dream. Also Thank the you. next wave of internet, um, how do you think uh, the digital economy, the metaverse can be inter uh, integrated with the, uh, the real economy, Dan? Uh, the internet economy has been the main driver for innovation in the past decade. And now we're at this new stage as far as I can see, the metaverse is really uh, opening up a new world for further investment, and it might provide opportunity to change the economic growth model. But at this point, uh, especially for the Chinese market, I don't see a real commercial application for that yet. Um, the main reason might be uh, that it doesn't really address uh, the daily needs of the general public. Uh, the real economy, uh, for example, uh, in terms of manufacturing, it would require more robotic use, uh, more of a uh, automatic automation uh, in its production process. Um, but the metaverse would require more of a virtual control, and that requires, for example, like a better internet connectivity, uh, more uh, and a better sensor uh, during this whole management process. And China is um, growing, uh, is having this growing interest in industry, 
but I think we're still in this infancy stage. Daniel, do you think there could be an integration between the Web3 and uh, the real economy? Yes, uh, Web3 and Metaverse, uh, those are very uh, exciting topics and trends. And uh, I, I think in the, uh, the Metaverse has a potential to uh, synthesize um, AI technology, IoT technology, uh, large amounts of um, diverse information, which are very difficult for uh, for humans, uh, for the human brain to comprehend, and already a metaverse is playing um, a role in industrial manufacturing. Uh, what what I mean is that in in factories, um, in our assembly lines, uh, there are already lots of AI vision being used to uh, for to assist welding, to assist uh, quality control, and on top of all those um, image uh, uh, data. Uh, those video data already there is a new layer of information and that you can you can also call that a layer of intelligence that layer uh, is assisted by AI to help uh, to reduce human um, labor actually to reduce human um, effort to uh, to understand how we can build our products quicker um, and uh, without having to stop uh, humans get tired but uh, robots they work overnight and uh, how to connect all these robots. Um, I, I believe um, Metaverse is already, is already there, but mm. perhaps Metaverse isn't making as much of a progress in the consumer sector, but in industrial manufacturing, uh, I, I personally have a, uh, have a great um, hope. And, and I, I wouldn't even say this hope, I, I would say there are already lots of evidence this will drive real economy um, uh, yeah, in the decades to come. All right. Now let's talk more about the uh, pillars that are supporting China's growth. So infrastructure investment um, has contributed to um, a big part of China's economic growth in the past couple of years, especially during COVID. Um, Dan, you mentioned that that will not uh, that will only continue maybe into uh, next year, but then it will might it might decrease in the coming uh, years. So, uh, what do you think will uh, replace infrastructure investment and become like the main supporter for China's growth going forward in the long run, longer run? The main driver in the coming decade has to rely on one way or another the innovation. And when we talk about innovation, it's not just R&D. It is also the application of the scientific achievement that we already have. They need to be commercialized. And past decade has seen this wide application of consumer-based technology, and these are the soft tech. And next decade, we'll see more of those hard technology uh, being used, first uh, maybe related with military and then to civilian. Uh, and for China's export, it has been quite a significant contributor to the GDP growth. But uh, in the next year or two, export probably will decelerate, uh, given that the world is going into a recession. Um, so China now is trying to climb up the global supply chain. And that means we will probably be able to take more of the global market share from Europe and the US. And that can give us a better potential of long-term growth. Wow, what's your take on that, Daniel? Infrastructure will, will always be there because it serves the greater good. And uh, uh, there are ongoing projects to retrofit our infrastructure for resilience. And I think globally, uh, because of the climate uh, disasters that uh, many nations or, or many infrastructures have uh, seemed so fragile. So I think renewable energy, energy security, uh, these things are going to boost uh, our infrastructure resilience in the years to come. So retrofitting um, uh, existing old infrastructures for, for the future to be future proof, I think uh, this, will, uh, this will continue to, to drive growth. So despite the current weakness of consumption, I guess, um, China still wants consumption to play a major role in China's economic growth. What do you guys think um, that China can do to boost consumption in the coming years? We don't need to boost consumption. Okay. Because if you and me, uh, Li Yun has the money, we know how to spend. We do <laughs> so not making need money to stimulate. is the key. <laughs> so you already have a TV on your wall. Do you need to buy a, uh, another TV simply? You ha you're going to have 50 quite of subsidies. So you're just crazy. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's how to increase income. Mm -hmm. 
and then you know uh, you you move from a three bedroom to a four bedroom or even to a, a real horse uh, uh, in the suburban area. So this is really a fallacy to mm -hmm. boost the consumption. Okay. And uh, uh, and then on the supply side, how to really cater to the uh, increasing demand and the increasing taste of consumer preferences. So that's something what they need to do. But on the supply side, we have been doing a lot of work just to reduce some of the redundant capacities. But uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the supply side of public goods, which is pretty much in the missing, in terms of education, in terms mm -hmm. of Medicare, in terms of public health, et cetera, we're doing a great job already. But uh, uh, the gap is still there, which is identified also by this report. And then how we can really bring a, uh, a balance uh, between the uh, rural area and the urban area simply by institutional reform, by further relaxing the type of household registration system. Because, you know, if we really do need to have higher income and to have, uh, you know, a uh, higher consumption rate uh, through this urbanization process, we need to give equal status to those uh, you know, migrating workers who are working over there. So now it seems that, uh, well, the Ch uh, Chinese government has given a sort of benevolence, oh, your kids do not need to return to your home just to take a test for the, uh, 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 for the universities. But now the limit is that uh, you know, all, all those kids can only, uh, if you really take, uh, take a test in Beijing, you know, for farmers who uh, uh, come from Henan province, for example, you're only allowed to go to the polytech schools instead of top-notch universities. So this is really uh, something that is uh, uh, there to be really streamlined. And uh, then, you know, confidence is very important because we always say people have bonded rationalities. Uh, if they are in a positive mood for future earning power, and then they will be able to spend more. But if, you know, uh, if they are not really certain about the future earning capacity, they tend to save even more than really they need. So actually, Dr. Sen, you know, he has, he has been a, uh, uh, winning his uh, Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, just examined that uh, during the difficult times in India, there has been always saving of surplus food. Uh, so this is really a social psychology. So, uh, in a nutshell, you know, gave people uh, more opportunities to earn more money mm -hmm. and gave people more uh, equal treatment so that uh, they can really, uh, you know, compete on the same level playing uh, play fields and also gave people more confidence into the prospect that is lying ahead. Uh, that's something that's more convincing instead of painting a picture on the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, improving consumption uh, has a lot of uh, uh, relevance with uh, other things like upgrading of manufacturing because uh, upgraded manufacturing will be provide new, new products, products uh, new, new services, services, for example. Uh, and, and of course, course uh, that, that is also uh, related, related to, to the uh, common prosperity effort. And uh, with this common pro uh, prosperity, effort, people will have probably have more money in their pocket. I would say that elimination of the concerns and the worries of the consumers are the most important thing. So removing those concerns by, by improving uh, those three areas, uh, I think probably will give a chance for consumers to spend more. Dan, do you want to elaborate on uh, China's trade going forward, please? Uh, for China's trade, there is an important transition because in the past 20 years, China has been focusing on producing final goods, especially final consumer goods. But now we see this deeper integration of China's supply chain with other Asian countries, especially with ASEAN countries. And in this integration, China has gradually shifted more towards producing intermediate uh, industrial goods uh, like cotton yarn, for example. And then China export those raw materials and intermediate industrial goods to countries like Vietnam and Cambodia, and they produce the final goods and then export to Europe and the US. Uh, I would call this a clear sign of China's upgrade of its supply chain, um, because when you produce more uh, on the mid-level of the supply chain, that means a higher level of automation. It's a lot harder to produce clothing or shoes uh, using the large-scale machinery 
But when it comes to cotton yarns, it's quite easy. And for other ASEAN countries, their trade dependence on China has been increasing significantly. So I can see a deceleration of China's foreign trade with the developed market. But with Asia, I think the trend is going up. Mm -hmm. Professor Liu, Dan was saying that uh, she thinks that trade uh, growth might decelerate because of external demand and a global recession. Uh, what's your view on that? Well, I have different ideas. Uh, even though China's uh, uh, trade war with the United States is still hanging over the air, and uh, we continue to have double-digit growth with uh, one of the biggest economies, and uh, uh, even by the last uh, the nine months, uh, we do see the China registered 9.9% uh, of the growth. So, uh, you know, when COVID is still uh, there to restrict the Chinese uh, trade. So uh, that's because, uh, number one, China, uh, the uh, powerhouse of manufacture is not really substituted by any type of uh, economies, uh, even though uh, you know, both Europeans and Americans are talking about, uh, uh, you know, reducing dependence on China. The fact is that it is very difficult. Their, uh, the households and the uh, individual businesses do not really agree uh, with that. So uh, the second is that uh, China is uh, still aggressively seeking for uh, global and, in, and the regional integration. And uh, the fact that we joined the uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership by promising to reduce the tariff, uh, you know, up to 90 percent and even more. And so this is something that is uh, there to give more guarantee to those, uh, you know, imports and exports uh, of those partners. And also we, are, uh, we have concluded the negotiation with the uh, uh, CAI, uh, which is the a comprehensive agreement on investment mm -hmm. with Europe. So hopefully one day it's going to kick off. And now we also seek for uh, the participation for formal membership within the CPTPP, um, which is even uh, more demanding on environmental, labor standards, etc. So it sees that China's resolve is still uh, extremely high uh, from the government. And there has been some you know, uh, criticism or even skepticism over the Chinese unified market at home. Actually, the fact shows, you know, from the work report, we do see that uh, a unified Chinese market on a more rule-based one is there to be more prepared for the Chinese uh, uh, interaction uh, with trade and investment. And the, lastly, I think, you know, uh, even though the, uh, the statistic data can decelerate mm. uh, and our connection with the, world, with the world is still strengthened. For example, if we do invest along the Belt Road in many other countries, we uh, have local manufacture, for, the, uh, for example, in India, it doesn't mean, uh, you know, come into account of the Chinese export, mm. but a Chinese involvement on a global basis is really uh, more deep-footed over that. So for that, I really continue to have the confidence and have, uh, we do really are there to welcome a better prospect. So for trade, what do you think? Um, are you as optimistic as uh, Professor Liu? Yes, you know, uh, trade is still uh, going to play a, a pivotal role in terms of the, uh, uh, China's economic growth. And if you read the report, you will see that there are 60 mention of trade in the report. But if you compare that with the previous uh, draft version, there were three mentions of that, mm -hmm. which is really a big uh, difference. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, uh, the, the focus uh, being placed on development of trade, uh, of course, there are uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 there are, uh, <laughs> There are a lot of attention being given to the development of trade in, in the past and in the future. And China, I think, will still uh, promote trade uh, in relation to its effort to upgrade its manufacturing, particularly in developing uh, technology-driven advanced manufacturing, uh, which will change uh, China's position uh, or improve China's position in the uh, uh, global value chain. Uh, in, uh, in the global trade. Uh, I think a trade is going to con continue to be 
uh, uh, one of the key contributors of the uh, economic growth. Let's talk about the property market. Do you think there's enough property curves to be loosened to, to kind of bring the property market back into uh, growth territory? Uh, we are in the worst housing recession mm -hmm. since the 1990s, and uh, the market um, sentiment has been at all-time low. Uh, there is a clear understanding that we will not see the kind of ups and, ups and downs in the coming years. Um, the government is quite clear that they would like to see more affordable housing, more rental housing in, uh, in the coming years, and the construction would uh, go towards that side as well. Um, I think for China's urbanization, it was a lot faster than many people had anticipated, which means the average living space is in fact smaller than what the MBS had estimated. And that shows we have a greater room for people to replace their current apartment to bigger ones. And to facilitate that, there should be more financing programs targeting the most vulnerable group, basically the bottom 20% of the income group. The property market is not doing so well uh, this year, as we all know. Do you think there's enough uh, property curves to be loosened in the coming years to kind of give a boost to the property market? Or what do you think needs to be done for that to come back up again? You know, to curb the buying activity, you can only delay and you cannot really eliminate the real needs. So actually for Chinese growth and for Chinese entitlement for a better life, uh, you know, housing is really something that's very decisive in terms of a living standard. And uh, as a growth engine, industrialization, urbanization, they all require, you know, housing programs or real mm -hmm. estate development programs. You know, we can really uh, be there to better manage, uh, for example, how to build the right houses together with the environmental consideration, together with travel consideration to those industrial parks, etc but we cannot really eliminate that. And second is that uh, we need to tr tr uh, streamline what is really uh, commodity housing and what is really you know, welfare housing. What's your guys' take on that, Professor Lee? Property market, you know, if we are, uh, I think we're specifically talking about housing market. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the housing market is undergone, has undergone uh, some sort of a adjustment uh, and, uh, and being rationalized. And there are uh, different kind of uh, government efforts to try to uh, maintain stability mm -hmm. of the housing market. And, uh, um, and there are also uh, government uh, funded uh, housing uh, to make sure that uh, the less privileged uh, households will have uh, their own housing. Uh, uh, basically, I think in the future, uh, it is going to continue to play a role in the economy, but I think it will be uh, eventually overshadowed by the investment in other infrastructure. Uh, uh, that is to say, the role of uh, property market is going to be offset by the uh, uh, effort to develop other infrastructure projects, particularly, for example, industrial foundation re-engineering mm. and uh, other uh, uh, technological uh, R&D, for example. Okay, Daniel, what's your take on that? What I see uh, in the yeah in the coming coming years, uh, the growth uh, of construction uh, of housing and property will be in um, construction technologies uh, such as industrialization, um, uh, prefab or uh, modular construction technologies, and these are easier. To, uh, to be standardized and uh, it's easier to monitor for the government. And then perhaps we are going to move away from the old um, uh, sort of a br very brutal model of low quality construction of, um, of unpredictable uh, material qualities towards something that is a high manufacturing mindset for the future of housing. And this will uh, truly be a Chinese innovation. There is a great emphasis on high level opening up. What does that mean to you? How can China promote that? And also what can China do to attract more foreign investment going forward? Um, China has been uh, making great efforts to uh, improve the market access. Uh, 
The negative list in the past few years has been shortened significantly. And I don't think there is a general loss of confidence from foreign investors when it comes to the economic prospect in China for the long run. But in the short term, this uh, uh, economic forecast is quite difficult uh, with all kinds of uncertainties regarding policy and COVID control. Um, for further opening up, I also think there's one critical step, which is the internationalization of RMB. Uh, the capital account needs to be further open up to welcome um, the capital inflow and outflow uh, with more flexibility. And that requires um, better regulation and probably a lot, a lot more wisdom when it comes to policy making. This high level of opening up is also emphasized in this report. Um, what does high level opening up mean to you? Well, uh, actually, first time in this uh, very important official document, mm -hmm. we uh, noticed the wording, it turned out to be systematic opening. Okay, systematic opening. Yeah, yeah. so high level systematic opening, which means uh, demonstrates the Chinese further resolve to assure the world and to assure all the Chinese stakeholders that uh, you know, China's door will be opened wider and wider. And this means, you know, in, uh, one is that we do welcome uh, continue to welcome foreign investment, but of course, you know, on a uh, more a selective basis now, because, for example, I uh, had a discussion with the mayor of uh, Suzhou, and he said, okay, 20 years ago, I almost stood on my knees to beg for any type of foreign investment into my city, but today, I'm talking about empty the cage for good birds, which means, you know, those foreign investment who uh, are more polluters, mm -hmm. who are uh, very labor intensive, you know, they just invite you out. Mm -hmm. So they give you the enough compensation. You can go to Vienna, you can go to Cambodia, you know, uh, goodbye. So, uh, and so that's really the upgrading of the high quality development by relying on foreign investment. And the other is that uh, we are uh, we really opened uh, China on a, a gradualistic but a steadfast basis, you know, from uh, southern uh, east part of China to the coastal region to uh, then uh, gradually the, uh, the whole China is really open for foreign investment. And right now the challenge is that, as Dan mentioned, is that uh, how we can really further liberalize or is it appropriate to liberalize the capital account of the Chinese foreign currency. So that's something uh, that's a, uh, quite a test. And uh, uh, we do see that over the past nine months, the foreign investment in China uh, exceeded more than 16%. So it's, it shows that uh, China is still the magnet for global uh, investment. It, you know, yes, you have a lot of problems to complain with China, the COVID restrictions, and the, uh, uh, the bargaining power of the Chinese labor force. And, but where are those good places for those uh, foreign investment if it do, they do look at uh, on long-term return? So the quality, uh, on the other hand, you really see the quality of the Chinese labor force, mm -hmm. the comprehensiveness of the Chinese industrial cluster, and uh, the uh, uh, expediency and the convenience of the Chinese uh, infrastructure in logistic support, and so, and also that uh, you know the large talent pool mm -hmm. uh, that are still there to support the Chinese real manufacturing uh, sector. So these are something that is highly uh, highly attractive for foreign investment. So what does high level opening up mean to you? Opening up is, a, uh, uh, is the fundamental policy of the country, which will not be changed uh, as stated by the report. That is a demonstration of China's determination you know, to open the door to the world and uh, to, be, to continue to be in integrated with the global economy. And that explains China's uh, effort to, to continue to support globalization, multilateralism, uh, and so on and so forth, and the liberalization of trade and investment. And those efforts, I think, will be re reflected in China's trade practices and the investment practices, uh, particularly in welcoming um, foreign investors. 
uh, to make sure that they they are having, for example, a uh, a market of stability, a situation that they can predict, and uh, of course, uh, a market that they can uh, have uh, reasonable profitability. And most important of all, you know, as we can see on the twenty uh, fifth of October, just a couple of days ago, and. DRC released the new uh, policy measures to encourage uh, incoming investment in the in manufacturing sector. And one interesting development is that those companies uh, will be allowed, uh, when they are qualified, to get public listed on the uh, uh, domestic stock market. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know, that is a big change. And with regard to the uh, COVID control, uh, the government has started to, to, to implement a kind of a fast track to facilitate the travels of, uh, of, of foreign personnel, mm -hmm. uh, businessmen uh, coming in and out of China. So uh, I think those uh, are the two examples of many uh, other examples to demonstrate China's determination you know, to, to continue to commit to uh, integrating uh, to being integrated with the world and uh, welcoming uh, the foreign investment to become part of the China's economy. What do you think will be the challenges that China faces from the external environment in terms of opening up? Right. Uh, if we're looking uh, from today, you know, there are a lot of challenges. You know, the two uh, major ones. Uh, probably uh, is the pandemic, which will probably last for another couple of years and how long, nobody knows. Uh, and the other one is the, uh, the, the uh, Ukraine uh, uh, conflict mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, you know, that has actually, and the, of course the, uh, the sanctions related to, uh, to that uh, situation you know, has this disruptive impact. And uh, today we have already uh, seen the, uh, the result uh, of, of, the, uh, of the conflict, uh, particularly on the oil and the uh, natural gas market. And that has, you know, probably fundamentally changed uh, the uh, economics of, of the economic development in Europe in particular, and the cost uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, probably will also accelerate the deindustrialization process in Europe, and uh, which is not really a good thing. Uh, but that will also change the landscape of uh, investment flows. And uh, many of the European businesses started to flow to the United States, and some of them are considering uh, investing in China. Uh, but those are the challenges that China faces, but the world also faces. Uh, you know, we should actually focus on the challenges that we're facing domestically because that is very critical in terms of maintaining stability and in order to play a role of a stabilizer in the world economy. So we need to resolve our own problems like, uh, uh, you know, the supply, uh, supply side uh, reform, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like the structural uh, ad adjustment, uh, like the, uh, uh, the, the improvement, uh, strengthening of the innovative uh, environment to make sure that uh, we're going to be uh, standing uh, not really uh, ahead of the uh, world, but at least in par with the world, and to make sure that we are able to be uh, you know, in line with the trend to make sure that we are uh, able to achieve, uh, you know, modernization and new industrialization on the way uh, to achieve the uh, second centennial uh, goals. Okay, great. Now that's all the time we have for today. Many thanks to all of you for sharing with us, Mr. Liu Baocheng. Dean of Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economics, Li Yong, Chief Researcher at DNC Think Tank, Dan Wang, Chief Economist of Hang Seng Bank, China, and Daniel Zhang, Broad Group Vice CEO. Thank you all for this edition of this talk. Thank you for being with us. Until next time, bye for now.